Hello and welcome to this alumni webcast on volatility-based decomposition. I know most of the people on the list, but I know we have easily an equal number of people as guests, so a few words about myself. This is Juval Lowy. I'm the principal of iDesign. I've been a software architect my entire career. We specialize in system architecture and also project design. I'm also the Microsoft Regional Director for the Silicon Valley. Does a lot of work with Microsoft. My recent book is the third edition of Programming WCF Services. I've already started working on the fourth edition. I've been working a lot with Microsoft on, at the time on .NET and WCF. Speak at conferences. Microsoft has recognized me as a software legend, something they've only given for the world top six uh, so far due to the impact I've had on the industry. And if you need to reach me after the webcast, it's idesign.net. So let's talk about this webcast. We heard a lot from the alumni that after they attend the Architects Masterclass and learn about the iDesign method, there's still the battle of convincing everybody as to what is the correct way of decomposing a system. How do you go about doing it? How to avoid the classic mistakes? And so the purpose of this webcast is to introduce the uninitiated for this notion of volatility-based decomposition and uh, also what not to do. So we're going to start by discussing the classic mistake of functional decomposition. We'll discuss why it is so alluring. We'll go on to discuss the correct decomposition, which is volatility-based decomposition. This webcast is also not about the iDesign method. We can easily spend a day or a week on the iDesign method which is the very detailed, meticulous way of going about doing the architecture. And so I'm only going to hint at the method, maybe highlight some of the things that the method leverages with volatility based decomposition. So this is not an iDesign method webcast, although we may, may just touch on it. So let's start with what not to do. It turns out the absolute classic mistake in decomposing a system is doing a flowchart decomposition. Now, what is actually the composition in the first place? We need to build a system. Now, we don't want to have a design which is just one big thing, and we don't want to have design to have lots of little things. We want to have some kind of a combination of modules we put together. And a very natural, classic, wrong way of doing it is a flowchart decomposition or a functional decomposition. You look at the functionality, what is the required functionality of the system, and you decompose based on that. So if you need to do A and you need to do B and C, you're going to have the A service, the B service, the C service. So if you need to do some sales and some trading, you're going to have a sales uh, service and a trading service and so on. And that is literally the kiss of death of architecture. If you do that, the project has failed before anybody wrote the first line of code. Now, function decomposition is not just in functionality, it's also in time. It's not just you have an A service and B service and C service. If you need to do A and then B and then C, built into the very fabric of B is the notion it was called after A and before the C. So that means you can never actually just use the B. You can just extract the B. So kids could buy things like reuse. Kids could buy maintainability. You can't just maintain the B because it invariably has implication on the A and A implicate, it has impacts on the B. Now, because your system doesn't just have A or B or C, you're typically going to have hundreds of those functionalities. Functional decomposition leads to explosion of services. You're going to have dozens, hundreds of those little things running all over the place. The other extreme is also possible. Instead of having lots of little things, you're going to have a few bloated God objects. Because you take the object and start pumping it up with the A and the B and the C. And all those intricate relationship has to be buried somewhere. So it's either inside these God objects or somewhere floating in between the objects. Another problem with functional decomposition is somebody has to decide do the A and then the B and then the C. And that typically tends to be the client. So you are almost always forced to push the integration or the orchestration of those functionalities into the client. And we all know polluting the clients with business logic is a bad idea. Also, as you do the A and then the B and then the C, that means entering the system in three places now. Multiple points of entry is guaranteed pain. All of a sudden, there are three places to worry about security, scalability, throughput, responsiveness, error handling, instrumentation. I mentioned that functional decomposition typically yields either too small or too big services. 
and it often does it side by side. Here's a cyclomatic complexity analysis of a functional system that I was called to do a design review on. And you don't have to discuss what the system is doing at all, but just look at those giant green objects as far as complexity. And the cyclomatic complexity tool here lets us see what are the complex objects. And we don't have to know anything about main form, but we do know it's going to be a nightmare to maintain, to extend, to reuse. And besides, how come a form object, even if it's the main form, is such an ungainly god object? And why is the form setup just as insanely complex? I mean, think about all the things you need to do to, to massage things into this god object. And why are resources so insanely complex? And then look at all the bazillion little objects running in between those god objects. This is not a pretty picture of an architecture. Now, services get too small. And then we discussed that it's up to the client to stitch them. But it's more than just stitching them. It's more than just polluting the client with a little bit of business logic. It typically leads to a bloated client, just like that God object from the form from the previous slide. In fact, you typically would tend to actually keep the object as dumb as possible and the client as smart as possible, because the other way around would mean that any change would have to actually go and uh, affect all of those uh, services. And so, Having this giant client makes the client very complex, polluted. Now, you could say, well, I know a way of fixing that. How about I just have the client initiating the call, and then have the services call each other? Unfortunately, functional decomposition, this doesn't work as well. And the reason is it doesn't ever behave the way you see it here on the slide. It's not as if the client calls A and then calls B and B calls C. In fact, it typically tends to be like this. And the reason is you have to have additional uh, unwanted bloating of A and B, simply because A now has to know about B, and by knowing about B, A has to take care of the parameter of B, and has to contain also parameters to pass on to C, and has to deal with the failure of B, and B has to take care of C, and B has to take care of the failure of C. And if you think this is bad, you'll be correct, but this is actually not the way it looks at all. The way it really looks like is like this. And the reason is, what happens if you're all the way into C, and all of a sudden C fails. Somehow C has to reach back into B and undo the B and also undo the A and B has to undo the A. And there's all this incredible complexity literally fusing these horribly complex objects together. Now, I can prove to you another way that functional decomposition is the wrong way of doing it simply because of the following set of questions. We all agree that design is a high added value activity. Now, the second law of thermodynamics basically states that you cannot add value without sweating. Now, if you think about functional decomposition, it's very straightforward. You look at the required uh, functionality. You have an A service, a B service, a C service. And that means you can actually do the design quickly. But it turns out quickly and easily design simply contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. If you think that functional decomposition works, you're basically saying, I can get away without hurting the first, the second law of thermodynamics. The sad thing about functional decomposition is this is what most people do. This is what the professor showed them in computer science classes. This is what everybody is doing. If you want to take a core section of the entire industry, almost 100% of all systems out there are designed in a functional way. It's so alluring. I mean, it's like the sign song of, of architecture. You need to do an A, you do an A service, and B, a B service. And one of the hardest battles you're going to fight is not doing the right thing, which is coming up, but getting them to stop doing the wrong thing and valuing the right thing. Uh, in severe cases, consider doing an anti-design effort. Inform the team that you're doing do a design contest, that you're going to see uh, what is the design for the next system. Now, you have the team, and put one half in one room, and you say to them, spend the next afternoon trying to come up with the best design for this system. Say to the other half, your task for this afternoon is to come up with the worst possible design for this system. A design that would maximize our inability to maintain it, to extend it, to reuse it. Let them work on it for one afternoon, and then you bring it together. And then you will see they actually did the same. Now, the label may differ, but the notion of the design, the essence of the design, would be exactly the same. And then you tell them, you know what? You weren't actually working on the same problem. So what does it mean that you actually we're working on opposite form, we came up to the same results. Of course, the team that was tasked with doing the best design would also be a functional team. 
And it turns out function decomposition and not to use it is actually nothing to do with software architecture. This is a universal principle. They should never design anything functionally. For example, let's talk about designing and building a house functionally. If you were to list all the functionalities of a house and do the composition of it, it would look something like this. You make a list of all the functionalities of a house, and then you have a cooking block, a playing box, an eating box, a bathing box, and so on. This is a purely functional decomposition. Now let's pretend you're going to build a house the same way you would build a software system. How would you build just cooking? So you get a clean plot of land, you want to build your dream house on it. You start by doing cooking. You have a master 1.0 need to do cooking. The, cu the customer is waiting for cooking. You promised cooking. So you take a microwave out of the box, and then what? You can't put it in midway. So you build a little scaffolding just for the microwave. You put a little roof just for the microwave. Connect just the microwave to the power grid. Put a little box. You can put some uh, uh, groceries as a makeshift pantry next to it. You announce to the customer, cooking is done. But is cooking really done? What about cooking on a stove? What about cooking in a room different than the uh, kitchen? Done this way, cooking is never done. Done this way, you are locked into perpetual refactoring and re re refactoring, re 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 refactoring. It will never actually be done this way. Any attempt of lying to the customer saying, we're done with cooking is, is complete dishonesty. Now, I could say, well, I mean, this is really an extreme dumb way of doing a functional uh, building of a house. We don't just do cooking. We do cooking in a kitchen. So a variation of it would do something like this. Let's do a functional decomposition along a domain line. So here's a kitchen, a bedroom, a garage. This is a very logical function decomposition of a house. So now the question is, how would you go about building it? How would you go about building just the kitchen? You have a master 1.0 kitchen. So you would pour foundation just for the kitchen, put walls just for the kitchen, roof for the kitchen, connect the kitchen to the sewer, to the plumbing, to the power grid. You put the appliances in there, you're now to the, ki to the customer, kitchen is done. Now let's do a bedroom. The first thing to do is bust the stucco off the kitchen so you can get to the foundation bolts, unbolt the kitchen, put it on hydraulic jacks, move it aside so you can actually bust the foundation, so you can actually dig new foundation for the bedroom and then pour continuous foundation for the kitchen and the bedroom, move the kitchen back on the new old foundation, uh, tear the walls off so you can actually have continuous plumbing, uh, heating, cooling, uh, electrical between the bedroom and the kitchen, tear the roof off the kitchen, put a new roof on the bedroom and the kitchen, re-put uh, uh, re the, uh, the, the, the drywall, the stucco, paint it, and then inform to the customer bedroom is done. Now, of course, in doing the bedroom, you also have to do it with the kitchen. Let's add another bedroom. Let's add an attic or a garage. Now, you would never build a house this way while trying to build a sofa system this way. And this is, of course, assuming that things are indeed pure as far as domain. But what if you like to do some cooking, say, in the garage or in a barbecue outside? You're almost forced to duplicate behaviors here. And we've actually looked at uh, cooking here as a single uh, functionality, but cooking is almost never just a single functionality. Cooking breakfast is very different from cooking lunch or cooking dinner. You have this explosion of functionalities all over the place. So my question to you is, how would you implement just cooking? Now, it doesn't make sense building a house this way. Why would it make sense building a software system this way? The fact that you could, in a software system, first paint the house and then back the walls into the paint doesn't make it a good idea. Now, in the physical world, this kind of insanity doesn't actually work. It would be too cost prohibitive. So there's physical constraints preventing you from doing this. But in software, you can just go wide. Now, let's look instead of a house, let's look at say, at, uh, a software system like a stock trading system. And here's a simple stock trading system with a bunch of requirements. The People who trade stocks and be able to buy and sell stocks, and that's actually the, the reason why we have the system in the first place, to, to buy and sell stocks. They should be able to also schedule trade, they should be able to get some reports. The system needs to be able to process data feeds on the value of stocks, analyze some trades. The client is required to be a browser with some kind of a connected block step execution. You press the button, you do a trade, you get a confirmation. And of course, there's maybe some request for some email uh, on uh, a scheduled uh, uh, trade, or maybe after every trade you get an email. And you're required to store the data in the database. So if you were to look at this kind of uh, simple requirement for a trading system, let's do a functional decomposition. Now, a pure functional decomposition, 
a naive decomposition would look something like this. Literally every area of functionality, there is a matching block in the architecture. There's a block for buying stocks, not to be confused with a block for selling stocks. And there are separate blocks. If you sell stock, there's tax implication. If you buy stock, there aren't any. If you buy stock, you need to get money. If you sell stock, you, you, you create money. So it's separate functionality. Note that uh, there's uh, a separate block for reporting and analyzing and processing a feed and so on. There's also blocks for storing the data. Literally, there was a functional requirement to store the data in a database. And here's also a page for uh, presenting information to the user. Now, most function decomposition are not going to be as bad as what you see here. This is kind of like an extreme function decomposition. Most people don't do it as bad. But even uh, mostly dead is still dead. And so what's wrong with this kind of a function decomposition? It clearly supports the requirements. You have maximized uh, your coupling to the requirements. And let's see what's wrong with it. Well, the problem is the system tends to change over time. Now, we know that the client now is the one that has to orchestrate the selling of the stock, the buying of the stocks. If you have a box that says selling stocks and a box that says buying stock, somebody has to actually go there and say sell and buy and schedule. That has to be the client. That orchestration has to now reside inside the client. And now you start polluting the client with business logic. Now suppose the client is a web page because that was the requirement. But the question now becomes, what will it take to change this client to be a mobile device? Now, besides rewriting everything on a mobile device, it may not be actually even possible to use those blocks. Those blocks assume it is the client that calls the A and the B and the C. Maybe the mobile device cannot even call those things. In fact, what kind of reuse chances do you have? And what kind of yanking code out of the page and putting it in a mobile device? We know the chance of that is very slim. That page is devoted for being a page and orchestrating those things from the page. Now, the the a notification in the requirement was an email. Suppose over time it will change and now it will be a text message or an SMS. Well, the, if you look at the architecture, the buying stocks component when it's finished buying is sending an email and the selling is sending an email and the trade is sending an email, it's scheduled a trade or executed a trade. Now, if you're going to change from an email to a text, you have to go to every one of those yellow boxes and change the way to notif notify the uh, users, which is a huge expensive change to do. What about switching a storage? Suppose instead of a database, you want to move and store it in a cloud storage of such. Now, the problem is that every single one of those blocks does some kind of database I.O. They store and uh, they, they insert and update. So I have to go and visit every single one of those blocks. And you say to it, you know what, from now instead of doing a database I.O., I have to do a cloud uh, storage I.O. And that, of course, means impact every single one of them. What about changing the interaction pattern? What if instead of doing a lockstep execution in the browser, you now require to do some kind of an asynchronous flow? You push something and you keep doing other things, and then later on you get the results. Now, all the components were absolutely written with synchronicity in mind. They assume that when they are done, everything that there was to do with their stuff is done. But now if you're going to do asynchronous, what kind of insane coupling is between the A and the B and the C as they go and bounce between each other and try and reconcile all the partial success and partial failure and the uh, overall flow. Now, the system is designed to trade stocks. Now, suppose you want to change to a different uh, trade item, for example, currencies or futures of currencies or, or commodities. How would you go about introducing a new trade item? The problem is that your selling block is, is not just selling. It is selling stocks. It is designed to sell stocks. It's not about stocks. There's no way you can just go in there and say, you know what, now you're going to sell commodities. So it's a total rewrite. It's a total change. What if you want to change the feed that provides the market updates for the system? Well, every single one of those yellow boxes goes to the feed and says, what is the current stock price so I can buy or sell or schedule a trade? And so if you change the feed, that means go and change every single one of them. What if you want to globalize this system? I'm not necessarily just talking about changing the language. Obviously, that's a big change. But changing the language itself may affect the yellow boxes if there's some user information that they need to do. But what about going into different markets, subjected to different regulation and different taxation? All of it would impact the system. Now, every single one of the bullets on the slide here is a major, major pain for the system, precisely because it went functional. 
And none of these things on the slide here were part of the original requirements, but as time, as time went by, they have changed. Systems always change the requirements. That's what requirements do. They change. If requirements would never change, none of us would have a job. We are all watching this webcast precisely because requirements change. In fact, the more requirements change, the better off everybody is going to be. Now, if you design against the requirements in a naive functional way, then it stands to reason that as the requirements change, your design will have to change because you designed against the requirements. And so the more requirements change, the more pain you would inflict back on your side. This is not a good place to be at. Now, here's what the scholars say about it. And if uh, in intellectual luminary is Mr. T, it is the fool who does functional decomposition, then we surely know that this is the wrong thing to do. So what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do, which is a small part of what we call the design method, is to decompose based on volatility. Volatility-based decomposition means you don't look for errors of functionality, you look for errors of change. You identify errors of the system that could potentially change. And then what you do is once you identify those, you encapsulate those in building blocks. We can call them services, modules, classes, it doesn't matter. You encapsulate them in building blocks and components of your system. And then you implement the required behavior by integrating those services together. And so you never actually go about looking for functionality, you look for volatility. And the idea is very simple. If something is volatile, if you already encapsulated it, then if it would change, you have contained that change. And if things will change, you have minimized the impact of the change and the pain that goes with it. You haven't maximized it like functional decomposition. Now, this is a universal principle of a good design. It has nothing to do with software system. You would not be able to use any kind of a system if it would not encapsulate the change. A classic example is, again, a house. If you look at something like power, you have power in your house. And look at all the volatility in the power. The power can be 110 or 220. It can be 50 hertz or 60 hertz. It can be anywhere from, say, a few amps to 20 amps. It can be on a certain gauge of wires, 10 gauge, 12 gauge, 14 gauge. And there's an immense amount of volatility, but you don't actually care because all of that volatility is encapsulated behind the receptacle. You don't actually care how the receptacle is doing it. As long as you can plug into it, you're good. You don't care if the power comes from the power company or a solar panel on your roof or a generator in the backyard. It's completely encapsulated behind the receptacle. Now, in the early 20s, where the first power grids were actually implemented, houses had many receptacles, some for DC, some for AC, some for low voltage, some for high voltage. It was quite common to actually use uh, some kind of a voltmeter to go and check every receptacle because it would, before they would plug anything to it because of the volatility there. Now, it is inconceivable for us to use a house this way, but that is what you would have to do. But you choose not to do it, you choose to encapsulate it. Now, functional decomposition maximizes the impact of the change. Because your decomposition is functionality and not change, as change happens, by definition, it impacts multiple areas in your system. That means there's multiple places to go and change. You are coupled to the change. Now, the problem with volatility-based decomposition is that volatility is often not self-evident. How many times has a customer started a dialogue with a software architect by saying, we want to build a system, and we may change this, and we may change that, and over time, we may going to do it over there, and the customer says, well, sometimes we don't want to do it like this, we want to do it like that. They never actually have a conversation like that. They always discuss it in terms of functionality. Here's the features that we want. Now, because I never present in terms of volatility, volatility based decomposition takes longer than functional, which is a good thing because now you abide with the second law of thermodynamics. You will add value as you do volatility-based decomposition. But it does take longer. And the trick I find is not actually doing it. With a little bit of practice, as you will see in the next few slides, you can absolutely do a great job at it. The problem is getting management support. Time and time, the manager would come to you and, and, and scratching his forehead and say, I don't understand why this is taking so long. Do the A, do the B, do the C. 
And the problem is they will not support you to invest the time and truly go into the root of what is indeed the areas of volatility. Now, the answer for any time the manager is saying, I don't understand why this is taking so long, is twofold. First, you say, yes, I know. By your own admission, you don't understand. This is why we're doing something else that you don't understand, because by your own admission, you don't understand. Ask them, how many times have you met the schedule in the past? How many times have you met the budget? What was quality like? Because all that excess com complexity, of course, will tend to kill quality. And if the answer is we often miss a schedule, we never meet the budget, and quality is poor, then you say, look, uh, so you want me to achieve better results by doing more of the same? That's basically insanity. Let's not do this insane thing on function of decomposition. Let's do something else. Now, the manager will simply not understand why functional decomposition is more challenging than why, why functional decomposition is the wrong thing to do. And they would constantly try and dumb it down. And that's actually not specific to your manager. That's very human. There's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is the tendency of people to look down at things they don't understand. So whenever you encounter a new field that you don't understand, it doesn't have to be software architecture, be pretty much anything, your first instinct is to assume it is less complex and less demanding than it really is. You never think, no, it's more complex than what it is. And the Dunning-Kruger effect was put forward in 1999. So this is relatively a new recognition that people actually tend to do it. And so as you try and introduce volatility-based decomposition into your organization, you will be fighting Dunning and Kruger. Now, second time around doing it is a lot easier because second time around, they will see the value of what you did. They will hear the success stories. And there's plenty of success stories on the ideas and alumni. People who are grinning saying, oh, that we did that, and the project was amazing on schedule and budget. We literally had to call back the customer and ask if they're actually using the system because there were so uh, few or no issues. And once you have that kind of success under your belt, they tend to leave you alone. But the first time around, you would have to educate them. You would have to show your conviction. And you would have to basically do it. In fact. Don't succumb to Dunning and Kruger. Never ask permission to do the right thing. If you think what well, the composition is the right way to do it, just do it. Don't ask for permission to do the right thing, ever. Now, as you go about uh, doing what is the composition, there's always a question, where is the volatility? Remember, with functional decomposition, it's very easy. The customer gave you the errors of, they gave you the errors of functionality. They say do the A, do the B, do the C, so it's easy, but they never give you errors of volatility. So there's a little mind trick you can do. I call it the axis of volatility, which is a way for you to identify what could change over time. Now, in the essence, there's only two ways anything could change. One is at the same customer over time. You deploy the system, and the same customer want to use it differently over time. So I can say, how would it change the same customer over time? Now. Even if you can freeze time, are all customers using the system the same way? Probably not. And so ask yourself, how would different customers use the system at any moment in time? According to the axis of volatility. So you can start with the following design. Here's this big blob. This is the architecture for our system. One big thing. That's the architecture. Can I use it to the same customer all the time? You would say, well, obviously not, because we know that now they want to do it like this. In the future, they're going to do that differently. So now you've identified something that could change over time. So you know what, let's encapsulate that thing. Here it is, I'm chopping it off, I'm encapsulating it. Could I now use this across uh, uh, all customers, even at the moment in time? And you say, no, because we already know that uh, some of them want to do that particular thing like this, and some of them want to do it like that. So you say, aha, I need to encapsulate that thing, that aspect. And you simply keep doing it. And that's how you go and identify the errors of volatility by these two axes. Now, I also find that the axes should be fairly independent. They tend to encapsulate things from each other. Things that tend to change at the same customer over time are hardly ever the things that different customers want to do differently at the same moment in time. Now, this is not uh, a perfect rule, but it's a very good correlation that this is actually the way it behaves. Now, when things don't behave this way, Specifically, when things change across both axes, it typically indicates that you have some kind of a functional decomposition on your hands. In the case of a house, let's do a volatility-based decomposition of a house. Now, I look at my house, and I look at what changes. And every once in a while, uh, 
the wife likes to change the furniture, but she changed the way the living room looks like, and she adds things and she arranges things around. So in my mind, I've identified that furniture in my house tend to be volatile. So I'd like to encapsulate that. Now, 15 years ago, we didn't have uh, uh, low energy consumption appliances. With the price of energy today, everything is star energy efficient. Seven years ago, we didn't have a flat screen TV. Nowadays, I'm thinking you can buy a traditional TV anymore. And so appliances tend to change. A few years ago, we had a baby. So you know what? The occupancy of the house tends to therefore change. And when you had a baby, let me tell you, that's a big change. Every once in a while, the wife likes to change the appearance. She either changes the drapery or she paints things. So the appearance apparently is volatile. Now, the way I'm connected to the utility company tends to change. I may get the power from the power company. I may get it from a solar panel. I may get internet from DSL. I may get it from a satellite. I may get it from a cell phone. I may get it from cable. Now, obviously, I don't want to change the way I'm sending email or doing this webcast as a function of my utilities. So obviously, I'd like to encapsulate that. Now, this is the way my house changes over time. But even if I were to just copy and paste my house and move it to a different city, would it be the same house? And the answer is no, because it would have different neighbors. It would be subjected to different uh, city regulation, different taxation. And of course, houses are not exactly the same. There's different in structure, two floors, one floor, uh, wider, narrower, and so on. And so even if you can freeze time, there are going to be differences across different consumers of the entity called the house. And so note that nowhere do we see here a block called cooking. There is no concept of a functionality called cooking. You would implement cooking by integrating these blocks together. Note also that the axes are independent. The city doesn't care about the occupancy in the furniture. As long as you uh, abide by the building permits and as long as you pay your taxes, they don't care about the people who live in the house. And that's a good thing. Now, it turns out there's another downfall for, fun for uh, functional decomposition. Look, say, at cooking. The customer wanted cooking. There was a requirement 1.2.3, need to do cooking. But tell me something. Was cooking really a requirement? What is the true requirement here? And it turns out that cooking is a solution masquerading as a requirement. The underlying requirement may be to feed the occupancy of the house. Now, Cooking may be a solution, but how about we go out for dinner? How about we order a pizza? And so the real requirement may be feed them. Now, if it was phrased in terms of cooking, you are required now to implement a solution masquerading as a requirement. And of course, the underlying requirement is feeding. It's not cooking. And as different solutions may evolve, your design will have to change. And in fact, it turns out that even feed them is actually still a solution masquerading the requirement. If you keep digging, you will discover that the real requirement is to take care of the occupancy or the occupants of the house, meaning their well-being is actually what matters. Maybe it's better for them to actually go to bed hungry in the interest of diet and better health. And so you have a spectrum of solutions from cooking to ordering pizza to going to bed hungry. All of them are addressing a particular requirement, which is the well-being. And all of them are different volatilities, if you will, in the way of implementing the well-being. Now, note how poorly functional decomposition handles solution masquerading as requirements, and how well volatility-based decomposition is the right way of doing it even here. If you were to encapsulate the various way you take care of the well-being of the occupancy, you don't care if it decides to cook or to go out for dinner. Now, a classic technique that we also show in the architecture clinic is when you go about designing a system is to simply prepare a list of areas of volatility. What could possibly change? Now, you do that before you do the architecture, before you do the decomposition. This is part of requirement gathering and analysis. In fact, the whole notion of requirement analysis is not to figure out what you're required to do. That is irrelevant. The only point of doing requirement analysis is to answer the questions, what could change? Now, the list of things could change may not be even given to you. Again, some of it has to be by you doing uh, a what if and what could change along the axis of volatility. And the requirements are just there to tickle 
your imagination is to understanding what could possibly change. So the first thing you do a list of potential volatilities. In the case of, say, the trading system that we had before, ask yourself, at the same time, could there be different types of users? In fact, who is the user and could the user change? Now, obviously, the system could be used by end users, day traders, but maybe some professional traders uh, managing entire portfolios. And so there's clearly some volatility here in the type of the user. Even though there was no functional bullet for it, now we recognize there's volatility in the user. The volatility in the user often manifests itself in volatility in the type of client application and technologies they use. For example, a casual uh, user may use a web page, but a professional trader would typically opt for a rich desktop app with lots of graphics and analysis and, and additional bells and whistles. And maybe we can have a really very light, almost read-only uh, user that does when you get an update on a mobile device about uh, maybe the trade or a particular value, maybe a suggestion to log on later to the real system, but you receive it initially on a web device. And so the volatility in user would manifest in volatility in a type of users. Now, the volatility in type of users typically would manifest itself in volatility in how the users would authenticate and also would authorize. Obviously, a rich desktop app may suffice with some kind of integrated with the security, but um, a more mobile or a web solution may go for something more federated or maybe some uh, uh, something primitive like a username and password. How you notify the users about the trade or the schedules is, of course, volatile. Part of the volatility is in the transport. We already mentioned one potential change, which is a change in the transport. If you go from email to a text message or SMS, that's a change in the transport. But how about if some users, for legal reasons, want to get a paper letter? How would you change that? Well, this is a change in the transport. But there's more volatility in notification. Who notifies us is actually volatile. If the block doing a trade notifies versus the block that executes the trade versus the box that just notifies you that you have scheduled something. So the volatility in publishers. There's also volatility in who receives the information. There's also volatility in the nature of the broadcast. It could maybe be a, be a queued broadcast. Whether data is stored is volatile. In fact, I hinted potential areas of pain before, and one of them was the type and location of the storage. You could go to a local database. In fact, that was the functional requirement. But what in the interest of performance, you're going to go to a cache. I mean, what if uh, you're going to go and store it very remotely in the cloud? So volatility in where the data could change, definitely. Then there's volatility in the type of connectivity and synchronicity of the interaction itself. You could do a very connected, synchronous lock step, review the information, enter some data, click the button, block, wait for it to execute, get confirmation. And that, in fact, was the requirement. But maybe over time you're going to do something else. Maybe you're going to queue up a bunch of trade. Trade this and then chase that. And uh, if these things change, do, do that. And maybe you want to execute these queued up trades in or out of order, which is another type of volatility in the way you do the connectivity. The duration of the interaction can be volatile. It could be just as simple as the functional requirement to complete the trade in one session, but maybe you're going to have some more sophisticated, long-running interaction that spans different sessions and possibly even multi-devices. I start by scheduling something on the web page, and I do some more on my mobile device, and then I do some more on the web page, and then I conclude it on the desktop. All of it across different time and different devices. The trade item itself is volatile. Over time, you may want to trade commodities. You may want to trade currencies. The system evolves. People may want to hedge stocks with, say, bonds. And so if I have a single portfolio, the trade item may be volatile. Now, volatility in a trade item may imply volatility in the frequency of the market data updates. For example, currencies may be much more uh, updated uh, pips per second and say stocks or, or, or bonds. Now, I don't know if this is actually the fact, but the fact that we have different trade items implies the frequency of the market update is volatile. Now, the volatility in the trade item implies volatility in the processing workflow of the trade itself. I suspect that buying or selling a stock is very different than buying or selling a future on a commodity. 
If you try to do some analysis as to how good was the trade in hindsight and what could you have done better, again, it's very different if you're analyzing stocks or currencies. There's volatility in the local, and volatility in local has implication, say, on trading rules. Maybe in some countries it is illegal to bundle trades and, and hedging of maybe derivatives in stocks. There's issues, of course, with UI localization. Some users may prefer it in one language or another. And of course, the very trade item itself may be subjected to what is legal or permissible in a particular locale. The feed itself could be volatile. Are you talking to it over some kind of a communication protocol? Well, if you switch to a different feed, say from Bloomberg to Reuters, are Bloomberg and Reuters using the same communication protocol? Probably not. And so there's volatility communication protocol. All of it stemming from the volatility in the feed. If you decide to change a feed, all of these things could change. How about the content? And it's not just uh, the fact that both are reporting stocks. Some actually report different values on the same stock at the same moment in time. What is the true value? And of course, they may use different format. Even if you use the same protocol, the frequency of the feed will be different, and the cost of that frequency will be different. And maybe some of the feeds can be internal. Some of it can be external. The externals you get from the stock exchange, the internal, maybe you're feeding some what if questions, and so on. Now, what is the moral of the story here? The moral of the story is that I could go on for a very long time describing what could change in a stock trading application. The previous four slides was not intended as an exhaustive list of all the possible things that could ever change in a software system. My objective with those four slides is to get you to think about what could change. What is the right mindset? What is the uh, blood trail that you follow is saying you have the scent, okay, this could change, therefore this and that and that and this. We don't have implication over here. You need to identify the areas of volatility. Now, also worth mentioning that some volatile areas may be out of scope. Yes, they could change, but that change has got too much to do with the nature of the business and there's some overriding decision not to go there. And honest to God, Three weeks ago, I'm with a customer, and they actually have a stock trading system. And I'm half smiling. I'm asking them, OK, uh, what if you're going to go for currencies? What if you're going to go for uh, commodities? And they say, the top price has made decades ago a decision not to go there because our whole notoriety is this proprietary stock trading algorithm. That's what people come to us. And if we go somewhere else, it would dilute uh, the brand, would dilute what we're trying to do. You know, perfectly valid. And so it's out of scope, we don't go there. But at least we made an educated decision not to encapsulate it. Now, it is vital to call out the areas of volatility as soon as possible. And here's why. Once you have the areas of volatility, you're going to designate certain components in the architecture to encapsulate them. Now, designating component costs you absolutely nothing. It's, it's a block full with some solid color on a diagram somewhere. It doesn't cost you anything. Now, later on, you may allocate the effort to design it and construct it, which is just fine. Then you have to pay for it. But at least you know how you're going to go about doing it. At least you know where it resides. At least you know what's your plan as far as the architecture, and then the design, and then implementation. And the sooner you do it, the better off you, you do it. If you don't call it out as soon as possible, I assure you that volatility is going to be spread across multiple boxes, and as it will change, it will be like tossing a hand grenade into your architecture with sharp sharpness flying all over the place. Now, once you've settled on the area of volatility, you're going to encapsulate them in services, in components, right? So in the case of a trading system, look at this possible decomposition. Now, every single one of the blocks here encapsulate something in the areas of volatility that we have here. So unfortunately, I'm going to go to the next slide to start analyzing this particular slide. Note that once you have the list of errors of volatility, the transition from the errors of volatility to services is hardly ever a pure one-to-one -one mapping. Why is that? It's because sometimes a single service may encapsulate multiple errors of volatility. Sometimes the way of addressing an error of volatility will not be with a service. It would rather be with an operational concept. For example, volatility in throughput the best way of encapsulating that is using queues. Sometimes there's going to be a third party component you're going to use to encapsulate a particular thing. Now, inside it may be ugly as hell, but you don't really care because it's a third party and then it becomes their problem. Now, 
some mapping is straightforward. For example, we discussed volatility in the data storage. And so we encapsulate that behind data access services. And so we introduce this gray layer of uh, access that access the storage. Now, most developers, most architects, we do this kind of a thing without giving it a second thought. But now at least we understand why. It's because we encapsulate the volatility of what is the resource, how we go about doing it, and where is it. Note also a key abstraction here. We refer to it as storage as opposed to a database. And because I refer to it as a storage, it can be a cache, it can be a dictionary in memory, it can be a file, it can be in the cloud. It doesn't really matter. But all of that volatility is behind the gray box of the data uh, or the storage access services. And as things will change, it will be confined inside that gray box and nothing else will change. The identification volatility is behind notification blocks. A notification block encapsulates how to notify somebody, what transport to use, a paper, letter, or an email. Who is the client require particular notification? Obviously, notifying a web page is very different than notifying uh, a mobile device. Now, in simple notification volatility, maybe you just need uh, a pub sub system. Maybe you need uh, something more than that because you have to do some filtering and some custom parameters. I don't know. Uh, but I know that all of that is inside that notification block. The volatility in the trading workflow is encapsulated in the trade workflow component. Now, we discussed all the things that could actually change here, but now I'm listing all the things that particular yellow box, specifically the, say, the trade workflow, is encapsulating. Inside that, I put what is being traded as encapsulated. All the specific steps in buying or selling are there. Note there is no more buying component, selling component. Any kind of customization for local markets is in there. Any kind of report you have to issue. Now, even if we didn't have to change the trade item, even if we don't go to different markets, we may want to change the workflow of executing a trade because the workflow itself could be volatile even if everything else is constant. Well, you know what? That's inside the trade workflow as well. Now, obviously, this kind of an approach will require some kind of a workflow tool to persist the workflow itself. Now, the system, the workflow itself, encapsulates volatility. Merely the act of persisting the workflow encapsulates additional volatility. Now, we discussed volatility in the duration of the session. Some sessions may be fairly short, some may be fairly long. But you know what? I don't really care. Every time there's a workflow, I persist it. And so if two seconds or two months go in between, uh, persistence and dehydration, I don't really care. The persisting of the workflow also uh, encapsulates the volatility in the connection type. It doesn't matter if they're connected over a web page or over a desktop app, they get work, they get directly to the same workflow. Same by the way with the volatility in the distributed session or the multiple devices. The volatility analysis is handled exactly the same way as with the trading workflow, meaning we're also going to have analysis workflow, we're going to persist the analysis uh, workflow, we're going to handle exactly the same as with trade. And good architectures tend to be symmetric as we know in the method. The volatility in the format of the feed is encapsulated in a feed transformation block. And all the good that has to go with coming up with a common baseline of what a feed looks like is inside that block. The security component on the side, you may have, I'm going to switch back to that slide, here some kind of a purple security box here. All the volatility and security is inside that particular block. How do we authenticate? What mechanism? Username and passwords, biometrics, federated security. I don't care. It's inside that block. What kind of transfer security? Are we going to use message security? Are we going to use uh, secure transport like SSL? I don't know. It's inside that block. So all the volatility and security is inside that block. Now, a key operational concept in the system is the use of a message bus for all cross-component communication. So nobody talks to nobody directly. They have to go to a message bus and send a message. Now, a message bus is merely a glorified queued pub sub. But the ability to queue up a message and then broadcast potentially to multiple recipients introduces benefits in this particular scenario. And the reason is volatility. You encapsulate the volatility in the required throughput. It doesn't matter if you have high throughput clients or low throughput clients. They all post messages to the message bus. And so I've encapsulated that volatility. You encapsulate all services. 
because the client only sees the message bus. If you think about it, if the client only posts messages to a message bus, then the volatility in the underlying services as I'm adding or removing services has to be encapsulated behind the service bus. Much the same way, the volatility in who and what is the client is encapsulated behind the internal components because we have a message bus. You see, they, to respond back to a client, never respond back to the client. They put the message on the message bus, which is then directed to a particular client. So I can add a mobile device later on. I can add a desktop app. It doesn't matter. I've decoupled myself from that particular uh, volatility. Every client box encapsulates a rendering volatility. And that goes to both the technology, meaning a web page or a mobile device, but also localization. A mobile device in Spanish is different from a web page in English. Note the feeds that appear in this architecture as simply yet more clients. And encapsulate the volatility of the source. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Bloomberg or Reuters. All of it dump messages on the bus and encapsulate that volatility as well. Now, it's important with volatility based decomposition to observe the following. Anything absent from the architecture is assumed not volatile enough and therefore nothing to encapsulate. And many times people who, have, who are new to volatility based decomposition, they find it strange that, what, so you don't have a block that does this and this? And the answer is no. If it doesn't change, there is no block that encapsulates it. It's as simple as that. I really, really mean that. If there's nothing to, if, if there's no volatility, don't name a block after it. If you name a block after it, you're doing functional decomposition. Now, once you understand how functional, uh, how sorry, how volatility-based decomposition works, I've seen people go overboard. I've seen people do everything and say, well, this could change and that could change and this could change and therefore I need a block here and a block here and a block there and have an explosion of services all over again. Now, I agree it could change, but you run the risk now of overdoing it. Not everything that could change deserves a block in the volatility-based decomposition. Now, a key candidate not to encapsulate is a change to the nature of the business. What does it mean? Could this stock trading system maybe in the future go into uh, controlling uh, manufacturing of semiconductors? Well, in theory, yes, but what is the likelihood of that actually happening? And so never try and encapsulate changes in the nature of the business. Yes, it could change, but it's not a good idea. For example, if you need to buy a house and build a house, is it outside the element of possibilities that the house will be transformed from uh, a single family home to a skyscraper? Well, the answer it could in theory. Maybe some developers, uh, land developers going to buy it and, and do it. But the likelihood of it is so low, it's not worth doing it. If you, if you do that, I say you're engaging in a speculating design. You're not really architecting. So don't speculate. Now, you see in the image here, a case of a speculative design. We have an item that is both uh, a lady dressing a uh, pump and a flipper. Is it impossible that a seminary would want to do both at the same time? No, but how likely is it? This is speculative design. Another hint I can give you is that when you do speculative design, each aspect of it is done poorly. Now, it's very important as you're doing volatility based decomposition to adopt what I call useful postures, meaning design a system both for you and your competitors. Ask yourself, if I were to design this system for our biggest competitor, what prevents them from using our system right now? So for say, say you're, using, you're working for uh, UPS and your biggest competitor is FedEx and you need to do the next generation system for UPS. You ask yourself, what prevents Federal Express from using our system right now. Now, both are in the shipping packages business. So why couldn't they use the same system? Well, it's because we do it like this, and they do it like that. Aha. Therefore, that thing is volatile. It could change. So I'm encapsulating it. Now, it, it bears no merit on the fact that FedEx will never use that system. The real question is, could you, in the future, do it like Federal Express? In fact, maybe there's a third way of doing it that you and Federal Express would converge to in the, in the future. So the purpose is to identify areas of volatility, areas of potential change. 
much the same way, you will identify things that both you and your competitor are doing exactly the same way, and therefore, no need to encapsulate those. Now, it has nothing to do with the functionality of what that thing is again and again. I also have to point out volatility has to do with longevity. By and large, the longer things do not change, the longer they have until they are changed. And here's a few examples. Harry Potter outsell uh, Moby Dick today. But you know what? I have a feeling that 100 years from now, people are still going to be reading more Moby Dick and fewer Harry Potters. And probably 4,000 years from now, they're still going to be reading the Bible. The point is, the longer things do not change, the longer they have until they are changed. Here is, uh, and, and, and this applies, by the way, to any kind of technology, any kind of a good idea, any kind of, say, the nature of your business. The nature of your business doesn't change. I have here a few kitchen appliances and utensils from Pompeii. These items are 2,000 years old, but you can put them in your kitchen right now. And everybody will ask you, where did you get those? But you see, the nature of the business of a spoon or a knife hasn't changed. Therefore, it's a good idea and it will be the same forever. The moral of the story is that you need to estimate when a change happens. And this is above and beyond things in the requirements. Now, you have to recognize that the ability of the organization or the customer or the market in general to instigate or absorb a change tends to be constant because it is driven by the nature of the business more than anything else. A big, large co corporation is not going to be able to change an entire ERP system overnight. A small company may want to jump uh, and do it. In fact, the more frequently things change, the more likely they would change in the future, but of course, at the same rate which means you have to take the impact or the potential for impact from that change regardless of requirements, even if nobody ever discussed these things. Put differently, ask yourself, what could change within the life of the system? For example, if you're supposed to have a system that's going to be in production for five or seven years, ask yourself, what has changed over the past five to seven years? It stands to reason it will also change in the next five to seven years. Now, it's important when you're doing volatility based decomposition to practice, and practice, and practice, and practice. Practice on everyday systems you're familiar with. Look at past projects. When you have hindsight, you already know what went wrong. You already know that this has changed, that caused pain, and that has changed, and that caused pain, and so on. If you're looking at your current project, maybe it's not too late. Maybe you can still save it. Look at all those functional services and say, no, that is bad. Look at non-software systems, bicycles, laptops, houses. They are all designed the same way. It's important to practice and practice it. I can do webcast only till, till the end of time, but you know some things you have to actually go and practice. I say you can't learn to ride bicycle from a book or by watching uh, YouTube clips on it. Strive to attend both the Architects Masterclass and the Architecture Clinic. Now, the both provide different takes on it. The Architects Masterclass teaches you the method, which is a highly engineered, very structured approach for not just looking for areas of volatility and identifying the core use cases and the relationship between them, but also how to go about mechanizing the design aspect that go behind that particular decomposition. The Architecture Clinic is your training wheel. It's where you get to practice over four or five projects in a team structure and do design reviews and present the finding and so on. It's important to practice. So we're almost out of time. I want to maybe touch briefly about something the method says. So now if you look at the taxonomy of the methods in the light of what it is decomposition, we have the client here, which encapsulates, of course, the variety of client application and technology and the volatility there. We have a business tier that has managers and engines. Now, to encapsulate the volatility in the business logic, we have to come to the volatility in a use case. What could change in a use case? Well, either the activities could change or the sequence itself. So we have engines encapsulating the volatility in activities. We have managers encapsulating the volatility in the sequence itself. We have resource access encapsulating how we access the resource. Where is the resource? And still do it, of course, in the lowest possible business context. And we have resources. On the side, we have common infrastructure and comes to the volatility in infrastructure, volatility in security, volatility in diagnostics, in logging. And so if you look at the artisan method to the lens of volatility based decomposition, it makes perfect sense. This is the right way of doing such an architecture. Now let me conclude this by putting a few observations here. 
a good system has to respond to changes. Live system respond. If you're fighting change, you're saying we're going to do this feature in the next annual release because it's too painful now, you're actively killing your system. You're promoting customers not to use your system. Now the trick in for the physical decomposition is not to fight the change. The trick is to contain the change. The trick is to minimize the impact. What you want to do is you're going to say, I'm not going to fight the change, but I'm going to take this hand grenade and put it in this uh, safe and it's going to kind of like blow up inside and contain all the impact. Now with functional decomposition, you maximize the impact of the change. Because for the volatility is not in one place, it is spread now across all areas of functionality. As change has happened, you have maximized the impact of the change. You haven't contained it. So it's the exact opposite. Now, we don't have time to discuss some uh, useful patterns. Let me just give you some visual uh, cues. It turns out that if you look at interaction between blocks using, say, the method, simply looking at the way it looks gives you a hint of, of to the quality of the decomposition. And I'll give you two visual clues that function decomposition typically is forks or staircases. And good decomposition is neither. So you've seen this on the alumni as well. If, if you have a client that stitches a bunch of errors of functionality, on a timeline, you will get a fork. It kind of like look from the left to the right of the fork you shove into your system. So functional decomposition often yields a fork. And if you have a client that does simply the stitching of the A to the B to the C, you typically end up with a staircase where A to the B to the C is like this long staircase to infinity. And a good decomposition tends to be neither. It's kind of like this thick figure. It's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I, I know it's not much, but it's a very nice visual cue as to whether or not you nailed it. We're almost out of time. Some resources for you. On the iDesign website, there's a lot of resources on volatility based decomposition, additional webcasts. There's nothing like going to the Architects Masterclass and learning about the iDesign method and how to properly do volatility based decomposition. And it's not just about the architecture. It's also about what kind of process you need to support volatility based decomposition. How do you ensure that developers stay on the blueprint and what are the technological tools you could use as far as uh, technical patterns as you use service orientation to go about supporting your validity based decomposition. All of that is the Architects Masterclass. We are almost sold out with the 2014 class in March. There's significant implication to the way you design project if you use validity based decomposition. You have to allocate enough time up front. You have to design your milestones based on the integration of errors of volatility as opposed to functionalities because if you're doing volatility based decomposition, the functionality will come at the very end of the project, not sprinkled across, which of course is just a lie. We discussed that. And so these two classes are a great uh, complement to this uh, webcast. We are out of time. Thank you all for watching.